Support comes from the Arizona Inn, a Four Diamond family-owned historic resort hotel and restaurant on Elm Street near the U of A. Information is at ArizonaInn.com. Hello everyone, I'm Jim Ninsel, the executive editor of the Tucson Weekly and Tucson Local Media. We're here to talk Zona Politics. Joining me today are two of my favorite people on the face of the planet, local cartoonist Dave Fitzsimmons of the Arizona Daily Star and Rand Carlson, who draws random shots in the Tucson Weekly. Welcome to both of you. Hello. Nice, nice to be here. Yeah, thanks for having us. You guys have a show underway at uh, this month at Contreras Gallery, Rational Lampoon, uh, celebrating political cartooning. Uh, Fitz, uh, how do you maintain as a satirist when reality has sort of turned into a reality show? I've given up. It's impossible. I just simply trace whatever's on CNN and just That's, go with that. I, just, I gave up. I cannot keep, can you keep up? No, I'm, I'm treading water. It's a tsunami. I, it seems like you have unlimited material at and this yeah. point. And now to the primary? Oh, I can't wait for uh, the uh, general election to open up here in Arizona. And yeah. it is it is opening. Uh, Rand, you've been doing random shots in Tucson Weekly. O over 30 years. More than three decades. What was your original inspiration to get into this? Well, it's funny. Uh, Bill Plimpton. Uh, was the original guy who had that strip in Doug's newspaper back in 86 or 87 and he got an Academy Award nomination for best animated short so he dropped out and so Doug came to me and said please help so I've been filling in ever since. <laughs> wow, that's, that's a good... I, I, did, was, I didn't know that story. I was a political cartoonist for the, the New Times in Phoenix, and so I was a natural choice to come in, and I would love and, to do it, you know. And what got you started in the political cartooning biz in the first place? Oh, my. If it is a bit. It's the I same as you. Well, yeah, I have a li like... little backstory. Um, so in 1971, I, I started cartooning for the Arizona Daily right. Wildcat. <laughs> so 71, 72, I was the cartoonist for the Wildcat, the very first political cartoonist. And then I left to go get on with life, and guess who Wandering. filled in? 73, 74, 75, Fitzfiller. 76. Yeah. Yeah. And then I came back in 77, 78, and 79. So Dave and I are the Wildcat cartoonists. The, the 1970s. For the 70s. I am this man's seat warmer. <laughs> yeah, well, you, you did a fine job. It seems like you've Thank gone you. on to to yeah. some success well, in we the still, business. Well, we still both work indoors. Right, which you can't say for a lot of political well, cartoonists anymore. Tan, things things know, have really, we keep, uh, we keep white. things have changed. Oh, uh, yes. You know, it, we have had a long and maybe not distinguished history for political cartoonists, but you know, there's that famous story about Boss Tweed getting upset at, at Thomas Nash's cartoons because he said his constituents may not have been able to read, but they could look at those pictures. Uh, talk a little bit just about uh, some of your inspirations uh, on, in the political cartooning field, people you came before you. Wow, you know, I, I think I would actually broaden it beyond political cartoons. Any, any, uh, Me too. any hero for free expression. I I was recently in Munich and I visited a shrine devoted to a 20-year-old college student uh, who in the 40s during the reign of Hitler simply distributed her essays in flyer form on the campus of the University of Munich. Uh, for that crime, she was arrested. She was tried on national radio by a Nazi tribunal and was found guilty and then guillotined in the basement of that courthouse the same afternoon nice. she was found guilty nice. simply for ink on paper, words on paper. Uh, so I feel very blessed to be uh, working here uh, in the United States of America and for a publisher uh, who uh, has some harmony with my views, unlike uh, Rob Rogers for the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette, who was just canned, canned after 25, 30 years there because they just uh, brought in a new editorial page editor who's a Trumper. Not, not, not a happy fate. Not a... But not a you, happy you political thing. cartoonists are almost an endangered species at this point. Well, yeah. we started, I was doing uh, American Association, AAEC, American Association of Editorial Cartoonists. That's back our in, group. Back in the 80s, there was, what, 200 maybe? And how many is there now? 40. And they're begging people to attend the convention. <laughs> uh, I know. So it's an endangered species indeed. Yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, who is working today in this field that you guys like? Just us. We're That's the youngest, it? too. That's it. We're uh, Tom Tolles, Washington Post. Ann Telnay's, Washington uh, Post, wonderful animation. Lukovic or Lukovic. Mike Lukovic, yeah. Uh, Ed Begley, S Salt Lake Trib. 
Yeah. Um, Pat Bagley. Pat Bagley. Oh, he's awesome. Yeah. He is so gutsy. He's He's uh, very critical of his former church, the Mormon Church, uh, and he sort of worked single-handedly with the staff of that newspaper, the Tribune, to keep it financially afloat. Uh, I, I, I got to put a shout out here for Tom Tomorrow, who appears uh, in his strip. Dan Perkins, uh, This Modern World, appears in the weekly every week, and I, it, very enjoyable. I very I, cathartic. I laugh right? out loud every week when I get at the advanced look yeah. at that strip. Yeah. But also people like uh, Ralph Steadman or uh, uh, R. Crumb, you know, people from the, my cartooning past that have affected me and my style, you know, people that are beyond political cartooning. Uh, yeah, this guy has a great style. I, style. I love his work. In fact, I have a couple of his cartoons in my <laughs> studio because I like his line work. It's, it's like so he traces it's macho Van Gogh-esque, <laughs> just attacking the, he's merciless. <laughs> And folks, Me, who, folks can actually purchase some of these strips, right, at the, at the if show? If they're going lucky, at we're going to be in that political show. And we yeah. have a second show, if you didn't know about that, October 6th and 7th at the Steinfeld Warehouse. We have something to say with Hector Acuna and uh, David and myself and a bunch of other people. It's another good show to come see. That's yeah. a pop-up that... Uh, and there's going to be, yeah, for a couple of days. And it was censorship. You're doing something yeah. on censorship. Yeah. So. And that was uh, that showed in Bisbee earlier this year. It is, did. Is yes, that was great coming fun, up here to Tucson. well attended. <laughs> uh, Fitz, you had a tribute to John McCain. Uh, yes. You had a lot of respect for him. I did have a lot of respect for him because when I would disagree with him or question him, I got the sense he engaged in reflective listening. He was actually listening to what someone who disagrees with him was saying, and he was thinking in front of you of the answer. Whereas uh, occasionally I'll encounter, uh, you know, folks. You know, it's tough running for office. You got to, you know, rely on the canned material that's between your ears. But I always found him to be candid, and I always appreciate his sense of humor. I was always a disrespectful smartass when he come into the star, and he would laugh, and uh, he he couldn't resist but tell a joke or two. So yeah, you got a lot of poop for your, I'm not going to, you know, you, at least you won't see Trump in heaven. You got a lot of crap for that, didn't A lot you? of calls. Yeah, just because I suggested the commander-in-chief might end up in hell. I, I know what you mean about those chatty Kathy dolls <laughs> where they just pull their string and they repeat the same rhetoric right. over and over again. Yeah, so. and, and it is election season, which is kind of like hunting season for you guys. Uh, Rand, what races are you looking forward to sinking your teeth into here? Well, it's, it's got to be the senatorial race uh, between the women. And to be in Arizona, to have two women, Kirsten and, and Martha, going at it, that's pre unprecedented. Arizona. Polar opposites. Oh, they're gonna, it's going to be a cat fight. I hope they debate. Have you guys been working on your pink tutu sketches? <laughs> <laughs> wow, it was like a second after the primary for that ad appeared. Bam! It was right there. Wow, the pink tutu. I'm thinking, is that going to be Carmona's knock on the door late at night? Cinema's pink tutu. It seems like these are two women who are ready to become whatever they think the voters want them to be. Chameleons. Yeah. They. They, they seem to adapt. Or political survivors. One of the two, whichever yeah. you want to call them. Yeah, Cinema is a democratic moderate. I don't really agree with a lot of things she's done, but she has to appeal to the middle base, and so does Martha. So it's going to be really interesting how they finagle that, that uh, nuance in the middle. Yeah, I think Cinema is simply a political, I think she's a pragmatic thinker in the way she approaches policy making. Uh, as for McSally, I'm betrayed <laughs> by that woman. Really? Yes, because first time she ran, she leans over, gives me a little hug, and then she says, you know, I'm not one of those weird Republicans. <laughs> oh, shot right now. What are Things you have now? Changed. I would say so. Uh, how about Kirkpatrick versus, uh, versus Leah Marquez-Peterson? Ann Kirkpatrick uh, here in the I'm down here, Southern Arizona. I'm looking to you, buddy. Well, I like her, uh, um, of the Marcus Peterson, because you like I, li the woman? I, I liked her when she was doing the Hispanic Chamber of Commerce stuff. She's very yeah. direct. Um, but I don't think she could beat Ann Kirkpatrick. Uh, we'll, we'll see. You know, the state. Are we leaning blue? Are we leaning blue? I don't know. We, I guess we're going to find out. But well, Pima County's totally. I mean, I loved Steve Farley, and I was sorry to see him go down. Uh, he was. He, he knew legislation 
economics, policy, you know. Better caricature than David Garcia? <laughs> oh. I don't know, that's a tough oh, one. That what is do you a tough think, one. Yeah, what's the line that Doug Ducey, his hair, it looks like one of those it's Lego like a thing snap you stick on. on the it is. Yeah. It, it yeah. Just put it on there. Uh, Fitz, Wendy Rogers came out on top in this congressional district one. And you're, I think you're, uh, your district, right, up there in Oro Valley? Wendy, right. you, you, which way are you leaning in? Wendy yeah. Rogers, Tom O'Halloran. <sighs> You know, I'm a law and order uh, liberal commie pinko, so I'm leaning uh, towards Mr. Haller and Rod. Yes. Yeah? Yeah. Yeah, same. Yeah. Yeah. same. Uh, he, oh, God. No, he's just bland, you know, so Tom, uh, Tom Blanderin. And, uh, we. <laughs> yes, a little bit. Uh, hey, he shows up. It's true. He does. Yeah, I've seen. Yeah. yeah. Um, uh, what else are you guys looking forward to this election season? Is there other stuff that is on your horizon? Oh, the You're apocalypse! Like, I'm getting my pen out and ready to go. Oh, the apocalypse itself on election eve—that's going to be so exciting. Who knows? As the days pass and we inch closer to the election, how desperate the president of the United States will become. What will he do? What can he possibly say day by day to top himself? And what impact will that have on all the races around the country? Oh, it's a delicious possibility. It's scary. It writes itself. It, it, it certainly does. I, I had this fantasy of doing a comic strip called Alley World. And it would focus the, the adventures of, of an elected official who battles Pima County's deep state. And I'm, I'm just wondering, would you, I, either of you be interested in illustrating? I it? would be interested in illustrating it because I have to tell you, I started a little comic series that ran once or twice where I suggested she lived in a bunker out near the biosphere. And that's, uh, that's where she listened to local talk radio. Turned into ham radio doo -doo -doo -doo, to stay in touch with all the other tinfoil hat wearing colleagues of hers. Is that unfair? No. Thank you. You know, I, I did once reveal the location of Allie Miller's home. Yeah, and you paid for it, I, Mister. I, a 911 call. <laughs> yeah, uh, a lawsuit. I, as I be sounds like malice of forethought to me. <laughs> well, yeah, well, I, I'm not confessing to anything here on the set. Uh, the show is <laughs> Rational Lampoons at Contreras Gallery, 110 East Sixth Street. You folks can uh, go check it out this month, and uh, we will be right back with former Congressman Ron Barber. Zona Politics is made possible with the generous support of The Loft Cinema, Tucson's independent movie theater. The Loft features independent foreign and documentary films, cult classics, discussions with filmmakers, and much more, including The Loft Film Fest in November. The Loft is located at 3233 East Speedway Boulevard. Showtimes can be found at loftcinema.org. Support for Zona Politics is provided by Hotel Congress in historic downtown Tucson. More information at hotelcongress.com and 622-8848. The Tucson Hispanic Chamber of Commerce serves the business community in the bilingual, bicultural region of the Arizona-Sonora border and is a proud media partner with Zona Politics. Learn more at tucsonhispanicchamber.org. My next guest is Ron Barber, the former Southern Arizona congressman who worked alongside and sometimes found himself in opposition to Senator John McCain, who died Saturday, August 25th at the age of 81. Ron, welcome to Zona Politics. Thanks. Good to be back with you, Jim. Uh, how have you been? Been great. Thank you. Retirement is a good thing. Uh, I, I wanted you to talk a little bit about John McCain. Uh, you worked with him, and he could be very partisan, but he was also willing to cross party lines. Talk a little bit about your experiences with well, him. Well, first of all, I, I admired him tremendously, especially in this time when we're looking at a national leader who's not leading, who's dividing the country, and who's just filled with hate and divisiveness and racism and all the rest. John McCain was authentic. You knew what he believed, whether you liked it or not. He had a great sense of humor. He was never afraid to say, I made a mistake. Um, and that, those, those characteristics were very attractive to me in a politician. Because, and I think that's why a lot of people really admired him and why we're seeing this outpouring of uh, goodwill and uh, compassion towards his family and, and people genuinely missing his voice on the national scene. So it was great to work with him, particularly on a, an issue that is important to Tucson, the A-10 uh, uh, airplanes. Uh, we were sort of bound at the hip on that one and 
were able to get it through the Congress uh, when I was in Congress. And that would have been easy for him to say, hey, never mind, I'll worry about this after uh, someone replaces you. Yeah, exactly right. But he, you know, he, he's above all of that. I mean, first of all, he knew, as I knew, that the A-10 was a vital uh, asset for our men and women in combat. When I went to Afghanistan on a congressional uh, trip, I asked the members of the uh, military who were there, I said, I I'm a minority member, don't have a lot of authority, I don't have a lot of influence, but is there anything I could do for you? And they said, if you can save the A-10, that would be our top priority. So I went back with renewed energy, and, and I had a partner in, in, in John McCain, and I really appreciated that. We met the day after my amendment was uh, uh, passed by the House Armed Services Committee, which was highly unusual, and we won 40 to 21. It was a bipartisan vote in favor, and uh, John wanted to meet and talk about it, and we went over to his office, and that's not only where his appreciation was shown in a nonpartisan way, but his sense of humor. My staff were with me, my chief of staff and my military legislative assistant, and he said, well, yeah, congratulations, Ron. You were successful in spite of these dumb people you have. And then as he, we were leaving, uh, he shook hands with my military legislative assistant, and he said, you did a really shitty job. I can say that on your show, I guess. <laughs> I, <just laughs> I guess. Did. I just did, right? We'll see. I mean, that's the kind of language, just straight up, that you could expect from him. He was always teasing people, you know? And then the most important amount of time that he and I spent together, we were flying back on uh, the Vice President's plane from the memorial for the firefighters that were killed up north. And we, we were seatmates for a better part of five or six hours and got a chance to chat about a lot of things. I just really liked the guy. I didn't agree with him on many issues, but a true American hero a guy who would not leave the prisoner of war camp without his fellow prisoners. I mean, there's so much about John McCain that we can admire, and we need a man like that or a woman like that, and we, unfortunately, I don't know who's coming along to take his place. He was definitely a, a conservative Republican, no but, but he would stick his neck out every now and then well, on, sure. on different issues. Two votes in particular, or two, yeah, two votes, I guess. Um, one, when he joined with the so-called Gang of Eight to put together a comprehensive immigration uh, reform package, it got it out of the Senate, never was taken up by the House, but that took a lot of courage, political courage. And then the other one that was even, I think, in some ways more courageous was when he voted to, to uh, do away with the filibuster that was preventing us getting a vote in the Senate on the bill that would have made comprehensive background checks for guns the law. And he voted uh, in favor of that bill. And never forget him for that, because given my experience and Gabby's, of course, that's a pretty important issue to us. And to find a, re a conservative Republican who was willing to say and do the right thing, that was pretty important. So there are a lot of things about John in his votes that I really admired. His last big vote, the health care. Oh, yeah. You know, um, the Affordable Care Health Care uh, bill that came up in 2010 was fiercely fought. Tea Party was everywhere, just challenging anyone who was in favor of it. Gabby certainly took her a lot of hits, uh, town halls and the like. And they needed 218 votes. And they got 218 votes to pass it. Fast forward, you know, this administration and the Senate wanted to abolish it or re repeal it without a replacement. And he came in and famously did this, thumbs down. That was pretty courageous, and too. gave a speech afterwards about, hey, why don't we go back to regular order, regular order. moving legislation through committees yeah, and absolutely. not this crazy, oh, we've got a bill we've written on the back oh, of an yeah. envelope, here we go, let's vote on it. He was very much uh, a man of the Senate. Um, and the Senate, um, some people say their rules are arcane, but their rules make a lot of sense. When you look at the two different chambers, the House is kind of rambunctious and the People's House and all of that, and 435 members. The Senate's supposedly the greatest deliberative body in the world. And he lamented, rightfully so, the loss of that camaraderie in the Senate, um, the loss of regular order where things went through committee and got vetted and hearings were held. And he stood up and cautioned his fellow senators you better get back on track. And the way we're operating right now is not part of how we're supposed to be acting in this democracy. You know, as long as I have you on the set, let's talk about the upcoming political sure. season. Uh, we got through the primary election. You were supporting Ann Kirkpatrick right. in your old district, Congressional District yeah. 2. Uh, 
it's an open seat with Martha McSally running for the Senate. It looks like she's going up against Leah Marquez Peterson. Uh, why do you like Ann in this race? Well, a lot of reasons. First of all, I served with Ann for two years. When she came back after losing her Senate, her uh, seat rather, in 2010, she was reelected in 2012. Important to me was that the reason that she wasn't in the House in, after 2010 was that she put her her career, if you will, or her re-election on the line and voted for the Affordable Care Act, one of the 218 members that did that. And it caused her to be defeated, even though she'd been warned not to do it by a lot of people. She said it's the right thing to do. So it starts with that. Secondly, knowing her as I did as a fellow member, I saw that she was a deeply compassionate and caring human being uh, about her constituents and about Americans in general. Uh, and I want that kind of character in a person that I'm going to support. And on virtually every issue that I believe is important, uh, we're aligned. The one issue that she has moved on, and that's what I'm really grateful for, is on the issue re regarding uh, sensible gun laws. When she worked uh, as a member of Congress in a rural district where a lot of hunting goes on and all of that, she had a, a different view. But she had her whole mind changed after the shooting in Tucson and the shooting uh, that killed all of those children up in Sandy Hook. And she genuinely moved in that direction, not just j just rhetoric for running in this district. She was making statements and co-sponsoring and voting for bills when I was there with her in 2012, and she did it in 2013 and 14 uh, as well. So um, I admire her a lot, uh, and I think uh, she is the only person in all of the seven who actually can win the general election because the outside money is going to be incredible against her. Paul Ryan's pack, the Koch brothers, we've seen it before, I've experienced it, Gabby's experienced it. They're going to come at her with everything. And she's the only person of all of the great people who wanted to run for this seat, the only person I think can pull it off. Well, uh, you know, that, that is going to be uh, one of the most competitive seats in the country. So it it's will be. be fascinating to watch. I mean, you, you uh, were defeated by 167 That's votes right. after all, so yeah. it's close. Uh, as long as I have you here, what, what's the you mentioned uh, the shooting on January 8th. What's the latest on the memorial project? The memorial is moving along. We raised enough money to put the memorial in place that we wanted. We had to make some changes in order to kind of deal with some uh, funding that we didn't get, pledges that didn't quite come in right. But it's going to be um, contracted out or the request for proposals would go out this fall, probably October, November. Uh, the, the county will be managing that process. They will let the contracts once they get the bids in. And we expect groundbreaking to start around January 8th of 2019. Construction should be completed six to nine months later. And this is going to be at the old Pima County Courthouse. Right, at the old historic courthouse. Uh, and it'll be, I think, a really incredible addition to that very historic plaza that we have there and all of its uh, history going back to uh, the native peoples of this land. Uh, we're going to have, in addition to remembering the people who were killed and those who survived and the firefighters and the police officers and all the rest and the community that came to help us, we're going to be honoring the resilience of this community going all the way back to the indigenous people. That will be part of the memorial as well. So I'm very pleased with the design, where we are with it. I'm currently the president of the foundation board, and it's my job to guide us along with a great board to completion, which will be about a year from now. All right. That's all the time we have uh, for this segment. But thank you so much, you're Ron welcome. Barber, for coming in and talking a little bit about John McCain and, and what you're up to these days. Okay. Thank you. And we will be right back with Alice Hatcher, the author of The Wonder That Was Ours. All of these young people from the community come together, actually like get up and do something. We can do anything! I think we've attracted like a lot of people that are like super passionate. Uh, we're here at the No Ban, No Wall protest. If you come out of college, you have this experience, you know how things run, you have a huge leg up. People who have ideas and who are, who are dreamers, you know what I mean, who really want to get themselves out there, I think that they should come here.
My next guest is Alice Hatcher, the, no the author of The Wonder That Was Ours, a new novel that has been long listed for a Center for Fiction First Novel Award. Alice, welcome to Zona Politics. Thank you for having me on. <laughs> All right. Uh, this book, The Wonder That Was Ours, has been called both funny and grim, jaunty and horrifying. Tell us what this book <laughs> is all about. Well, the book is about a taxi driver on a small Caribbean island, and he spent time in prison after his wrongful conviction for the death of a wealthy white tourist. The novel opens on the anniversary of his arrest when he's already feeling a little bit frazzled picks up two Americans who have just been kicked off a cruise ship, and this does happen, um, and takes them to a hotel where he works a second job. And the very next day, a virus breaks out on the cruise ship, the island is quarantined, and civil disorder develops pretty quickly in this hand-to-mouth economy. So it's really about four characters facing really a period of violence and how they are forced to find empathy and compassion within themselves. And it's told from the perspective of the cockroaches that live in this Winston fellow's cab. Right. Uh, what was the inspiration for that narration? There is a story there. First of all, I started off with a very introverted taxi driver, so I was always trying to think, how do I get into his head? And while I was struggling with this, a friend called one day, and apropos of nothing, she said, do you remember that car we rented in Miami? And I'd actually rented this car from a very shady outfit years ago, maybe 20 years ago, and the car was infested with cockroaches. And we kept it for a week. This was a really kind of chop shop, shady place. We weren't really interested in returning the car to a guy who looked and acted like Tony Soprano. So kept the car, drove around for a week. And when she said that, I thought, the cockroaches. If he has this captive audience, he's kind of eccentric, this introverted taxi driver could talk to the cockroaches. And I fell in love. The minute I started imagining their gestures, the antenna moving, the wings fluttering, I started hearing their voice, this collective voice, and I fell in love with it immediately. <laughs> and you are really exploring some race and class yeah. divides in this book. And, and what made you decide that was something you wanted to unpack? Well, that goes pretty deep into the psyche, but I grew up on, in Chicago, in Chicago land in the big sprawl, and most of my relatives were from the south side of Chicago where things are pretty tense, and I grew up hearing all sorts of things and being exposed to things that I really regret. I mean, it really, in a sense, damaged my psyche, and, and I don't say that lightly, but I've spent a lifetime being very race conscious because of that experience growing up in Chicago, which is such a segregated city. And I've always been interested in race, I've always been interested in class, and I studied those two things as a historian and thought that I could study those things maybe with a little more nuance actually in fiction. And this was actually a contest winning manuscript. Talk it about was. Zank. Zank books? The Zank books. The Zank books and, and the prize for fiction that you won here. Well, I'm very grateful to the Zank books. The Zank books is an indie publisher, and some people don't know what that means, but basically it's a smaller publishing house that does a limited run of books, although if it does well, they'll uh, do a larger run. But the key thing is you don't need an agent to submit. So I do not have an agent, and the reason that worked for me was because it's a slightly unusual book, and I, I'll be honest, I was rejected by a fair number of agents who said, we love the book, the writing's beautiful, we'd love to represent it, but we can't imagine selling this to the corporate marketing teams at Viking or Knopf or Little and Brown. So I think the reason why indie presses are so important right now is that they do have a little more room for the weirder novels that might not get picked up and as easily. You mentioned that you used to be a historian, and how long have you been at the fiction writing game? About eight years, and the great thing about writing fiction, so much of my fiction actually involved historical research. My short stories, this book, I did quite a bit of research. so. When I left my job teaching history as a professor, I was really sad. I, I just felt like I was stretched too far. I was trying to write fiction. You know, sometimes during faculty meetings, I'd be writing notes for stories, and it really wasn't working out so well for well, me. Those trying to faculty yeah. meetings can you know, be a little boring. So, so I finally decided if I was going to do either of those two things that I loved well, I had to make a choice. And so I jumped ship with a very supportive husband and 
have been now doing this for almost eight years is more accurate. And you mentioned your supportive husband, but you've also found support here in Tucson in the literary community. Amazingly, and uh, any writer in town knows that, but for those who don't write, there are so many resources. I don't have an MFA. So I really had to do a DIY MFA and teach myself. I went to Pima Community College and took some amazing classes. The Writer's Studio in town is a fantastic resource. The Poetry Center, U of A has classes they offer. So there's so many ways people can learn how to write here. And I think the writers in Tucson are dedicated. We know we're not New York City, so I think we're working twice as hard. And you have a book <laughs> signing uh, this weekend. At Barnes & Noble East Side, so that's the one on Broadway and um, I'm really excited about that. It's the first book event outside of this, after this, I should say. And it'll be from when to when on? Uh... Two to four on September 8th, which is a Saturday, and uh, I'm really excited to read it for the first time in public. Well, congratulations. Oh. The book is The Wonder That, is, that Was Ours, excuse <laughs> me, and uh, the author is Alex Hatcher. Thank you so much Thank for joining you. us, Alice. And uh, that is our show for today. My thanks to our media partners at Tucson Weekly, Inside Tucson Business, Tucson Local Media, Creative Tucson, and Community Radio KXCI 91.3, where you can hear a radio version of Zona Politics at 5 p.m. on Sunday afternoons. I'm Jim Ninsel. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time. Zona Politics is hosted by Tucson Weekly senior writer Jim Ninsel. The program is produced by Jennifer Powers Murphy and Danny Vinnick and edited by Jim Rundle. Special thanks to KXCI, Tucson Weekly, Brink Creative Digital, and all supporters who provide crucial funding for the program. Learn more about Zona Politics at zonapolitics.com and be sure to follow us on Facebook and Twitter.